if a B2B marketer isn't thinking like that and, and using the new trends and the new insights and the new, you know, being the early adopter, when the next pandemic happens or the next reset happens, who do you think is going to win? The B2B market that already anticipated and knows the trends and insights. And obviously audio is huge right now um, to my earlier point of, uh, you know, ways per second increasing um, uh, subscription services are, are on the, on the high, you know, things of the nature are, are on the high. Are you, do you have a subscription service for your restaurant? Are you giving, you know, loyalty programs? Are you allowing people to order through the speaker um, eventually? Those are the kind of mindsets I, was, I would encourage a B2B marketer to think about is how do you stay two years ahead of time? Welcome to the B2B Digital Marketer Podcast, a podcast helping you to end your struggle with digital marketing helping you to pave a new and better path to target and capture your ideal customer. Each week, we teach you how insiders and experts debunk the dreary and become engines of innovation. Now, here's your host, Jim Rembach. Hey, B2B DM gang. I'm excited today because we're going to have a fantastic discussion about somebody who is connecting and helps you to connect a whole lot of really opportunities. Let's just say that. And so we're going to get into more detail because we have Arjun Rai on the show with us today. Arjun, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really do appreciate this. It's such an honor. Um, looking forward to having a conversation around how we can help your audience, the underdogs of the world, get more out of their digital marketing. And, and okay, so that when you say that, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that come to mind. And I would dare mm-hmm. to say that 99.9% of the, the folks that are out there are the underdog. Wouldn't, they, wouldn't you say that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a huge percentage. I mean, if you take a look at it from a GDP perspective, you take a look at it from a macroeconomic perspective or whatever, small businesses, they're the lifeline of every single economy around the world. But here's the thing. When it comes to helping those small businesses, we oftentimes as a society only focus on the big companies, the Fortune 500 companies. And we've set out to build we're on a mission to build the biggest company in the world, helping the smallest. And so I like to say, you know, I'm, Hey, I'm Arjun Rai, founder and CEO of Hello Wolfie, which is a smart marketing dashboard for underdogs, because at the end of the day, that's what I know. You know, that's, that's what I feel. It's in my blood being an underdog, being a small business owner. I'm sure you can relate. And how do we beat the beep? I I'll censor it for you. How do we beat the beep out of our, you know, bigger competitors, the biggest competitors in our, our industry that have unlimited marketing budgets? Well, that's what we're set here to do. Okay. So now from what you just described right there is really what thrust, you know, me into B2B digital marketing, because I was a person that was in sales and was responsible for filling a pipeline. I was responsible for what I call contact to contract. Uh, and the person who I worked for, you know, uh, actually had never worked for anyone. Uh, they received a PhD in consumer science, got a project with Bank of America, launched the business. And so she told me um, after I came on board and grew the business as much as I could with the resources that I had and the connections that I had uh, that she goes, um, well, hey, I'm paying your salary, fill your own sales funnel. I'm like, uh, how do I do that? Right. Um, and so then that was, you know, almost 20 years ago. And it started thrusting me into learning from the B2C guys. And ladies, you know, about how to do digital marketing and leveraging it for, you know, my B2B needs. And that's kind of what started me on my path. So now when I start thinking about that from a small business perspective and start looking at helping them to be more successful, where, where, do, you, where do you kind of see that B2B and B2C breakdown? Well, the, the fact of the matter is traditionally, let's just go like 50 years, 100 years, 20 years ago, right? Um, a company had a PR department. If you want to talk to a company, you don't talk to a CEO, you talk to the PR department and they'll run it internally, right? Um, if you want a, a an update on the privacy and policy, if you want terms and conditions, you know, policy, you know, sent to you, you talk to the legal department. Today, if your privacy policy isn't on par, if your terms and conditions are out of whack, you know, people are consumers are going up, they're going crazy on social media and saying how a company should be more focused on their data privacy, their data, telling them where their data is, telling them how their data is being used and things like that, right? Um, if you want to reach out to the company for information for, for interview, you go straight to the CEO, you tweet at him, you, you know, Facebook DM them or her and you're, you, and, and you get a, you get a conversation going there, right? Or you meet the person in, uh, in, in at a, um, 
at a conference, oftentimes, you know, it used to be a couple of years ago, you get a sign, you know, here's my EA, go talk to her or him and coordinate something. Now, CEOs and founders are, try are trying to do the everything on them by themselves because they realize with the help of their assistants, they realize that the, the relationship factor between the customer or the investor and the founder or the CEO or anyone in leadership is super, super important, which is kind of where you're seeing new generation of, of CEOs um, like Elon Musk was very much about the founder, where right? it was very much about being at the ground floor. I mean, he slept on the factory floor with the, you know, with the technology that he was building and putting every single dime into, right? And so when you talk about B2B versus B2C, I think it's B2B to C. It's it's all because of uh, you know the consumer mindset being you know you know it you know every company has a consumer side to it now. Every every company has a social media aspect to it, has a you know a PR aspect to it, which is very relatable to the customers that they they are supporting. For example, IBM. You know, IBM. All the small businesses use IBM. Big companies use IBM. But one of the things that they've been doing really well over the last few years is actually making their AI system more friendly. It doesn't seem like it's, you know, uh, 1984 all over again. Um, they're trying to make their, you know, their, their platform more accessible to developers, more accessible to small businesses. At the same time, big companies like hospitals and whatnot. It's all about the persona. And, and that's one of the reasons why we have an animal on our, on our, as our mascot. He's, that's my dog, Snoopy. It's a Maltese. And because we love supporting underdogs, you know, we have a dog here and we called our company Hello Woofy because it's all about supporting the underdog, the small business owner, uh, and, you know, being your best friend, just like your furry best friend. He's always there. She's always there helping you along the way. And so I would encourage every one of your listeners to come up with a plan that nurtures the relationships. Don't silo your relationships, depending on the department and the category of the conversation happening from the co consumer or the customer. Put, you know, have it, have it in real time. We do, we do this in our Facebook group every single day. I respond to, you know, for example, Jim, if you say, hey, I noticed that this isn't working, I'll respond to you in video format. You'll see this in our Facebook group for 60 seconds. I'll respond to you and say, hey, Jim, I'm so sorry this happened. I'm gonna you know, prioritize this with my engineering team. Or Jim, thanks so much for that recommendation. I'm gonna throw it on our roadmap and see how soon we can get to it. B2B to B to C. Okay. Well, if I start thinking about that from an individual perspective, that seems like a daunting responsibility of constant, you know, tasks <laughs> to respond to, uh, especially if you're trying to say that you want to create the uh, biggest company in the world that serves, you know, the smallest, right? It's, yeah. uh, you don't scale, Arjun. I mean, some of these things aren't scalable. I mean, if you read a book called Traction by the guy who uh, founded DuckDuckGo, he tells you even for a bigger company, there are certain traction channels that are not scalable and you have to be okay with that because you're setting an example. Like we have paid advertising, we do podcasting, um, we do uh, different kinds of paid advertising, by the way, because our, our, our audience is skewing towards women. So we just expand to Pinterest, but the other, uh, other channels include the non-scalable stuff, like, you know, getting people into referral marketing, getting people into our affiliate program, getting people to, you know, me responding to in video. I can't respond to every single person, but at the moment as try to do as much as possible. And guess what? Other people in our Facebook group will jump in and say, hey, Arjun's a little busy. You know, give him a couple of days, a couple of hours. You know, it's a scrappy startup team. And, and I actually say thank you for jumping in and helping out the other customer as a fellow business owner. It, it just naturally happens. Well, I mean, that's actually part of the, um, the maturation process when you start talking about building loyal followers is you start, mm -hmm. you know, having some of those people do those things. And, and I think that's maybe a, a, you know, a scaling tactic uh, um, you know, whether it's intentional or not, you know, seems to be working out for you. So kudos yeah. to you on that. Oh, thank you. Virtual hugs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, and now we've talked around it. So let's talk to it in regards to, you know, how and what, you know, is going on for you to be able to enable yeah. uh, these small businesses to be successful and compete with uh, the 10,000 pound gorillas. The fact of the matter is you have to be consistent. Well, let me back up. You have to be known and you have to be participating in the conversation because if you're on the sidelines, you're going to wonder what just happened, not be a part of that, right? And we'll talk about smart speakers uh, in a second because that's that's you don't want to be on the other side of the bell curve when, as a late adopter. But the way you, you become known and you're, you participate in the conversation is by literally, in our case, Filling, our, filling up your library with content and launching campaigns, launching single posts, as we call it. Just start posting twice a, 
twice a, twice a week, three times a week, then increase it to five times a week, right? Maybe you want to do Monday, Friday, motivational content. You want to kick off the week on a high note. You want to kick off the weekend on a high note. And then Tuesday, Thursday, in your case, maybe you're talking about an author that has moved you, literally moved you and your business on Tuesday and another example on Thursday, right? And a tip, maybe an affiliate link if you want to, to the book. And then on Wednesday, in our case, every two weeks, we do Pet Wednesdays. We we promote, you know, our furry colleagues, our, our furry, you know, coworkers and people you'll see in our Facebook group are showing their dogs. They're like, here's my furry coworker today lying on his back and not helping me at all. You just want to start posting, just start jumping in the conversation. I was telling one of our clients, he, he has a, a bandana company for uh, service dogs, you know, who are supporting their owners who are disabled. Start showing photographs of the dog helping the owner and how proud the owner is of the dog and how health, you know, how cute the dog is with the bandanas on and whatnot. And he's doing a donation program as well. That's your content right there. Post it every single day. I mean, he has more than enough customers to fill out the entire year's worth of scheduling. Throw that into the library. Call it the daily, you know, uh, daily, you know, gratitude, you know, category if you want. And just schedule a gratitude, you know, um, campaign that posts every single day. If you start doing that, people you know, rec recognize you because the algorithms behind each of the platforms are designed to surface quality content, meaningful content. I mean, TikTok does probably this the best. I, I, I'm discovering people that I've never, wouldn't, I'd never have met before. I'm, pe I'm meeting them on TikTok. I'm DMing them. We're becoming friends. We're doing business together. Facebook is very similar. Twitter is very similar. So just start being a part of the conversation. Now, to my earlier point about smart speakers and not being a laggard, we talked about this before the show started. We, we literally started working with Amazon about a year ago to build the world's first smart speaker scheduler because we realized that the conversation, to my earlier point again, was ha the conversation between the TV and the customer or the brand and the customer had shifted to the living room all of a sudden or the bedroom, depending on what the smart speaker is. And we realized during the, during the pandemic that smart speakers, you know, I have 11, so don't judge me, but I have a smart, you know, this is the echo show. There's an echo uh, fire, sorry, fire TV playing in the background for listeners who are listening on the audio side of things. There's a TV back there running a, on a projector. It's a 200 inch using fire TV. And I, I was just holding up a touchscreen version of it as well. These speakers flew off the shelf. There were so many speakers being sold, uh, so many Alexa devices being sold during the pandemic. It's because Netflix and Hulu and IMDB and all YouTube, all of these applications were completely monopolizing your customer and my customer because streaming became a huge deal. Social audio became a huge deal. Clubhouse became a huge deal. And you're starting to see Green Room and other bunch, bunch of other uh, copycats coming out as well. So then I said to myself, what about, what about Jim? Why? Does Jim have a Amazon Alexa skill? Does he have a, an app as well on the on the TV? Like, can I listen to this podcast on my TV and say, hey, A-L-E-X-A, -E I won't say it because it'll turn her on, which sounds weird now. But um, uh, can I listen to a Jim uh, uh, you know, app and, and then have Jim on my screen, right? Because if you say the Hello Wolfie uh, skill right now, um, she'll actually start playing that skill and you'll see all my briefings that I scheduled through Hello Wolfie. So then I can hear Jim. He has his top author content right there. He's like, hey, Bob, Bob, uh, you know, Bob Greenberg of RGA, great author, just interviewed him. Here's a quick tip. If you want to learn more, click on the link to the left because you can, you can schedule links on the TV and click on the link to the left and, you know, go ahead, grab his book or see my interview, see the interview, the one hour interview I did with Bob. And that just doesn't exist. The coffee shop down the block can tell me this is how he brews the perfect cup of coffee because I couldn't go to his coffee shop. And if I want to buy the coffee beans, I, I can click right here on the TV or touch if I have a touch version of here and have the coffee beans delivered to my door in 20 minutes. Like, it doesn't matter. You don't need millions of viewers. You just need 500, 100 loyal customers to be able to have a conversation with that. And so we, we kind of pivoted to focusing on smart speaker scheduling and we're the only ones doing it. Okay, you as you're to, yeah, talking you about early. well, as you're talking about that, and even your case study and your use cases, you know, yeah. I, I start going back to that whole B 2 C thing. So, hey, I'm you know, I'm I'm not one of those types of people that has a you know a, a coffee house or or something like that, and don't, yeah. I don't sell to the general public. I'm trying yeah. to you know, really get business from other businesses or sell my products and services to them, and so maybe I don't have something that is you know conducive to being on some of those certain platforms. Um, you know, LinkedIn, you know, is, yep. is, you know, the primary uh, social platform for, you know, B2B. So mm -hmm. how does Hello Woofy in that particular use case in this particular environment, yep. you know, so, you know, may maybe I'm an organization that sells, um, 
you know, industrial uh, detergent supplies. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does Super that work? Super sexy. It is such a sexy <laughs> industry. Are you kidding me? I, I'm already thinking about it, like in terms of what you should be talking about. If you, if you, if you, there's a book, speaking of books, there's a giant pile of books next to Jim right now. Um, if you, if you, th- if you read the book, um, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, he talks about Febreze and how people were, you know, getting into Febreze. He talks about toothpaste and how people were initially not even caring about brushing their teeth and how they start, you know, brushing their teeth, how, you know, women were at the core of it. You know, they wanted to be presentable in, in terms of their home and the hap- you know, changing habits is very, very daunting for, for a marketer. That example you just gave me, I have uh, how to tips, how to clean your most, uh, you know, um, most, the, like the dirtiest things in your house, the dirtiest, you know, the, the worst spills ever. This is how you clean it. And by the way, it's product placement right there. And if you want to buy the product that we end up using, which is kind of like an infomercial, that's how you do it, right? You know, this is how you pour a little bit. You don't pour too much. Um, those are your top of funnel awareness, you know, content. The other thing you could be doing is, you know, having people actually, you know, wearing the the result of your hard work of actually being able to clean the clothes, right? Clean the, or maybe it's a home, like it's a beautiful home setting. It's a beautiful bed sheets, beautiful bed. And if you want to, you know, it's, it might feel like a Raymour and Flanagan a- advertisement, but actually it's all about cleaning your, you know, where you sleep, having a, you know, maybe a statistic on the side that says, I'm just making this up. 15% of, of U.S. consumers don't clean their sheet every week. And we realize that bacteria count goes through the roof within the first two days. Should you, you based on this research, we, we recommend that you, you wash your sheets every two or three days um, so that you're within a, a parameter, especially for the elderly. If you, if you have an elderly in the home, make sure you're cleaning every day or, or whatnot. Those shocking statistics, those lifestyle imagery, like you want to be clean, you want to be presentable, you want to be laughing with people, your friends and clean sheets and clean, wearing clean clothes will inherently drive the consumer to say, okay, I want that product because that product will allow me to look like that, will make me you know, feel like that. Um, if I were a detergent company, if you're a coffee shop, how do you make the perfect latte? How do you, what's the difference between a latte and a cappuccino? You'd be surprised how many people don't know the difference. Uh, what, are the, what is the difference between a medium roast and a light roast? You know, which one has more caffeine? Do you have a heart, situ- a heart condition where you need less caffeine or no caffeine? Do you, you know, what's the difference between a decaf and not a decaf? Where's the bean from? What is the story behind the farmer? You know, how are you buying, a, how, how are you, know, you buying the coffee bean? How is it supporting the farmer? There's a lot of like top of funnel content you can have. And you can, by the way, speaking of LinkedIn, that's, that's all great for there. Same thing on the smart speaker. Let the customer know what, how they're having an impact because otherwise it's going to be, you're going to have to wait for CNBC or CNN to cover your story and you're going to have to beg them for years to do it. You should do it now. <laughs> Well, okay, that's very helpful and insightful. But as you're talking and how we've talked so far, I start thinking of daunting tasks that are just piled one up on on another. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's probably what that's part of what you're trying to solve for. Right? Exactly, exactly. It just th- just throw all of your stuff into a library and then keep coming back to it over and over again. I still don't understand why our competitors are all about like you you every Sunday do the grunt work. Every Sunday do the grunt work. It's almost like you know a religious holiday uh, or a religious effort that you have to grunt work every single Sunday. It makes no sense at all. A small business owner wants to spend time with their cost, their, their um, customer, uh, their family, <laughs> their kids, their dog, right? They, they want to set it and forget it. And the artificial intelligence will help you create the content. As soon as you start typing, it literally auto completes the words for you, auto completes the words and sentences for you, it gives you the perfect emoji recommendations, which by the way, Jim, I don't know if you know this, but according to Adobe uh, emoji trend report, emojis drive double digit, huge double digits, uh, uplift and engagement and purchase intent. So as soon as you start typing, we'll start giving you those recommendations. We'll find the perfect hash list. We'll give you image, image recommendations even of images that are royalty free. So you don't have to wing it to figure out what I can use legally, what I cannot use legally. Like, why is this not already done? Like, why did 2021 have to come by or 2020 we launched last year, um, early last year? Uh, why, why does it take so long? <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense, but we're doing it. Well, I I think you bring up a really good point. Uh, You know, there are a lot of, you know, tools that have been out there for, you know, a couple of years that help to uh, enable, you know, some efficiencies associated with, you know, content, content management, some being the some being the keyword. (laughs) Uh, There you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So, okay. All right. Uh, If I'm sitting here and I'm saying uh, there's a, there's a, 
really a, a clear difference between, you know, a marketing and brand awareness, you know, type of activity and function and functionality mm-hmm. versus, you know, lead gen. They're, they're two very different. When I'm talking about growth, it's about lead and lead generation. It's about client acquisition and customer acquisition. It's, it's mm-hmm. about, yes, you know, the, the retention piece, but you know, oftentimes what I see is a lot of content people getting just stuck in the content bucket and they're just stuck here at top of funnel. Everything's top of funnel. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you enable and help with the actual, you know, gravitational forces that need to take place in order to get to the middle of the funnel and the bottom? That's the point. That's the key word. You need to, inc- you need to make it more attractive. You need to make it more compelling so that the gravity uh, naturally, you know, the, the, the customer will gravitate towards your business. You need, so top of funnel is great. Like we do as, and we ask questions like, you know, should you post, uh, when should you post uh, on social media? When should you post on Instagram? Right. Or then we say, you know, uh, uh, would you like a 24 seven social media manager? Right. Or, uh, co- you know, converse, you know, questions like that, uh, as, as far as, gra- you know, getting people into our sales funnel and then in our sales funnel, we need to make a case, and you can see it on hellowoofy.com if you hit the big green button. There's a video right there that says, not Jim specifically, but I say, hey, thank you so much for you know coming on to, coming to our, our platform, coming to our uh, to our website. Here's why you want to win it's in social media marketing and blog marketing and smart speaker marketing because X, Y, Z. And then it's also in text format. It's also in um, graphical format. And it exactly shows you why you if you use the platform, if you subscribe to the platform, you are going to win as a small business owner, as an underdog. You have to create that sense of gravity. In fact, if you're going to increase your gravity, make it such a no brainer, then, then it'll work out. Now, the other thing we do is if we do find certain, you know, people who come out, come on our sales call and, and they may not be, you know, entirely convinced that, you know, this is the solution that they need, which is surprising because 400,000 businesses shut down last year because they couldn't get out of their own traditional mindset, digital marketing and, and smart speaker marketing, blog marketing, all these things that we're automating is super important. But even if, if it, we haven't convinced them, we put them into our Facebook group. We put them into our Facebook group because I tell them specifically, tell me what feature you want us to build. Even if you don't become a customer, what is the one thing that you really would wish that our competitors would listen to you and build for you? Um, and uh, But obviously they're not gonna listen to you because they don't have a Facebook group. Um, they send you to the PR department. Um, and then if you are a subscriber, um, you know, what are some of the things that we can improve? You know, or what's, what are some of the things you don't like? Like be super, uh, you know, critical, give us critiques. Don't be, you know, don't criticize us, but tell us the critiques that go into improving the platform. And the, the, the more you see those dynamics of two different, you know, groups of uh, people, the ones who are customers, the ones who are, um, there's actually a third, but those between those two, you start seeing that the people who hadn't subscribed uh, early on, they actually see how engaged we are and how n- we're nurturing a relationship. We're, we're listening to our customers. They actually naturally become a customer. The third group is we've been doing something called equity crowdfunding which means anyone uh, uh, can invest as low as $100 into, into our company and own a piece of it using equity crowdfunding. It's also known as Reg CF, um, which has been, you know, has been a, an effort for years. And the reason I mentioned this is because our average lifetime value is about $493, $500 for a customer because our price points are $49 a year, $99 a year, super low. But if the customer puts in $100, what do you think the lifetime go, uh, becomes at that point? It goes from 500 to 600. We just increase our lifetime value by, by 20%. I don't know what other efforts you can do to increase your lifetime value by 20%, right? And so now to, to answer your question, bringing it full circle, we are now nurturing the relationship. We are bringing people down the funnel because we're increasing the gravity, if you will. We're incre- making ourselves more attractive from an investment perspective, from a you know perspective of helping you, your small business be a, a winner in your category, taking away the grunt work, giving you more time back. There's so many bells and you know so many things we can talk about, but you have to do that in the funnel itself. You can't just keep saying, "Oh, there's a question that might loop you in. Here's another question that might loop you in. Then what? It's like dating. Like at some point, you got to get to second base, and then third base, and then home, right? Um, you, you just can't, you know, keep you know asking the girl out over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good analogy. <laughs> okay. And at some, some point, the- you have to. At some point, you have to drop on your knees and close the deal. <laughs> there you go. Um, but as you're talking again, I start 
you know, really wanted to focus in on the B2B side. So like, for example, you know, you said something about the emoji statistics and, yeah. um, you know, when I see some, you know, B2B people using a lot of emojis, you know, I start judging them and putting them in a certain camp um, in regards to, you know, the, the quality and level. I, and essentially where I'm going to is that B2B seems it's that it's mm-hmm. more conservative, right? You can't do some of the things in B2B and get away with it and then have that gravitational pull happen that mm. in B2C, you know, or, or is, is my thinking a little flawed? I wouldn't say that to you. Uh, I, <laughs> I think, uh, I think it, it's, uh, it's changing, it's evolving, and you're seeing it. it we were talking about type zero civilizations, type one civilization, and how everything I'm doing or everything I want to do in my life as a legacy is about getting civilization from type zero to type one. A part of that is the mindset uh, that we have as a human species, as a as a collective, right? And 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 you'll see that in the rebels, you'll see that in the creatives, you'll see that at the at the lowest levels, the startups, in terms of where our future is going. I mean, if you want to take it from a family perspective, if you want to see the future, look at your kids. You know, where are they going? What are their interests? What are they? You know, what are what are you know what are the habits that they're developing? Um, it's funny. Uh, in a couple of a couple of years ago, I, I I listened to a video interview or it was, a, it was some sort of an article maybe, and the the girl, the little girl, she goes from her Xbox and she walks over to a microwave and says, "Open, uh, uh, microwave open," or and it's like Xbox turn on, microwave turn on, think something like that. It's adorable. I, the reason I say that is because things are changing. Emojis started with 90 emojis in the late 90s, but that's not new. Like we have, we've had hieroglyphics, we've had cuneiform, um, you know, uh, languages, you know, in Samaria, we had, you know, the Chinese language is entirely, you know, p- uh, picture based as well. History repeats itself and you'll see adopters, you know, early adopters always there. You'll see laggards always there. And at some point, we're just going to have an ecosystem where certain people and certain mindsets and certain companies will win and be a part of the trends and the new, and the new way of doing things. And the rest are just going to wonder how, what happened. And so emojis is a part of that. We are inherently cavemen at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, um, you know, as a, as a society, we like our visuals. We like conversing in visual form. How I'm talking to you right now, obviously this is a Zoom call and it's a Zoom interview, but when it becomes an audio interview, it's, we still have to, we start imagining, okay, Jim might be saying this and might be sitting there and doing this. Like Arjun might be doing this and sitting there right now because we have to fill in the gaps visually. And if a company isn't filling those gaps in in the marketing messages visually, they're really losing. Like if you're just going to say, this is a statistic, you know, hopefully this impacts you and makes you buy our product. Well, why are you not making an infographic out of it? Because an infographic is statistically shown to do better than you just telling me what the statistic is, because then I can visually see what the impact is on my bottom line or what the actual data is. And, and, and you know, see it visually. And we talked about this earlier, uh, I believe before the show, waves per second and, uh, and and frames per second, we are now seeing that because society is moving uh, technologically to, towards that, uh, you know, to being becoming more advanced, hardware, broadband, you know, technology in general is allowing us to have more frames per second, which is essentially video format now at scale, like TikTok, um, uh, or audio waves per second is increasing as well. Podcasts used to be something you downloaded and then listened to on a, on the go. You couldn't, you know, it wasn't like radio. You could just turn on and 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 listen to to it, right? But now we have Clubhouse. We can listen to Clubhouse. We can have live interviews. We can have live conferences, virtual or not, um, all over the world. And you know, with people all over the world, twenty four seven. I mean, I literally, if you look at my calendar, my first Clubhouse uh, room is at five a.m. this morning, and my last is at eleven p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> That's how I'm going to answer the question is that certain people will get it. Certain people won't. And that's okay. Okay. Then you had mentioned a a statistic associated with 400,000 organizations uh, that small businesses, small businesses that are no longer in existence because in essentially the the words that you were sharing is that they were disrupted um, Mm -hmm. because, you know, essentially they were blindsided or didn't, you know, do the, you know, adoption or, or, or adaption that needed to take place, you know, in order for them to survive or get through it. So if I was to, if I was sitting here and saying, I'm a, I'm a B2B digital marketer, I'm a, you know, whether I'm a, uh, an entrepreneur or a solopreneur or a small business, you know, how do I need to ensure 
uh, and and enable the ability for me to be the one that is the one doing the disrupting. If you if you think about some of the examples of companies and how they pivoted during the uh, during the pandemic, a restaurant became a grocery store because they already had the channels for you know uh, grocery delivery. They already had the channels and the partnerships for um, you know delivery in general and things like that. Yeah, and 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 they they knew exactly how to get. I mean, they were just overstocked with, in some cases with, with produce. All of a sudden, I see a grocery store on Seamless delivering food all over all over Manhattan, uh, you know, as an island in New York City. I'm like, what? This rest, this this whoever's the owner is super cool. He's like, he's using Seamless, which is a restaurant delivery platform, to deliver f- groceries, toothpaste, like literally. I, I, got, I think I got like Hagen Dazs uh, ice cream delivered to me from Midtown because this grocery store was the only grocery store on the platform because and they were like we're gonna turn this platform forget the fees we can talk about the fees structure another time but the fact that they were continuing to keep their store open their restaurant open you know things like that is super super innovative um there were a couple of other examples of people uh, pivoting and and making you know uh just actually some some uh, another restaurant actually turned everything into what they had they put all the groceries outside and they started selling that you know almost like you could you know walk out into a, a flea um, a farmer's market that kind of a mindset a b2b marketer has to focus on how do you make sure that you're not so focused in on one channel and 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 in the case of the 400,000 businesses. And this is a blanket statement. I'm sure there were some personal issues there. There were some other extraneous issues, but the point is they were, they may have been very traditionally mindset, uh, having a traditional mindset where, you know, they were expecting people to walk in and that was the business. If they made X dollars every single day, maybe more on the weekends, they were happy with that. But in most cases, for example, the smart speaker scheduler, we know that the trend is going towards more and more smart speakers are entering uh, you know, the consumer's home, home at this point. What restaurants are now trying to deliver directly so that they don't have to pay the fees to Seamless and Uber Eats, right? One click buy, one click, hey, this is Arjun I, you know, uh, on the TV. Hey, this is Arjun, I'd like to order a Mapo Tofu with, a brown, with brown rice on the side uh, and one click here to pay and you just hold up a, a phone to, to the screen and pay the QR code right there directly to the restaurant. If a B2B marketer isn't thinking like that and, and using the new trends and the new insights and the new, you know, being the early adopter, when the next pandemic happens or the next reset happens, who do you think is going to win? The B2B market that already anticipated and knows the trends and insights. Now, obviously, audio is huge right now. Um, to my earlier point of, uh, you know, waste per second increasing. Um, uh, subscription services are, are on the on the high. You know, things of the nature are, are on the high. Are you... Do you have a subscription service for your restaurant? Are you giving, you know, loyalty programs? Are you allowing people to order through the speaker um, eventually? Those are the kind of mindsets I, was, I would encourage a B2B marketer to think about is how do you stay two years ahead of time? Because Amazon, if you, if you, if you listen to any of Jeff Bezos' interviews, who obviously is stepping down, I believe, today, he doesn't even want to talk to you if it's not about things about, you know, that relates to five years down the road. He always tells you in the interviews that, I want, I put a team together around me so that I can think about where Amazon is going to be in five years and I can plan it. I can rehearse it. I can build it in my head. And that's the only thing I want to focus on. How powerful would that be if Jeff Bezos was a CMO of Amazon? <laughs> he, his marketing efforts, like, I mean, his marketing efforts in general for the last 20 years or so have been a customer obsession and seeing where the customer is going and, and, and giving that to them. I would encourage every B2B marketer to think like that. I think that's great insight. And um, so then as an individual, we have to ensure that we're carving out that time to do that type of, you know, uh, ideation and creative thinking and put ourselves in that position of others that are doing it. And that's one, also one of the things that I admired when I started learning about, you know, you and and how you've gone through and had several startups is that you've put yourself in that ecosystem of other startups intentionally uh, and you you are in constant communication to talk about uh, with the, with those types of folks three years down the road, five years down the road, ten years down the road. So you're yeah. you're you're emulating that. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, it can be your de- it could be to your detriment sometimes. <laughs> my uh, my philosophy that I've learned over the years is spend eighty five percent to ninety percent of your time and resources. And this is true for your personal life as it is for your per- professional life. Spend it in things that you have, uh, abs- you know, you have absolutely exactly the 
you, you know it, it really well. You absolutely know exactly where the trends are going. You know exactly, you know, what the customer wants. You know, it's a safe zone, essentially. For us, it's, it was social media management, it was social media marketing. And uh, eventually that included blog management as well and, and creating entire blog posts and scheduling them out. And then 10 to 15% of your time and resources and things you have absolutely no idea about. Absolutely no idea if it's going to work or not. It might be a new thing. It might be something outside your realm. Uh, for me, on the personal side, it includes fashion, real estate, carpentry, cooking. Um, and over the years, I've become better at those things. And, and guess what? I actually find that when I go to a board game meetup, for example, because I, now I'm getting into board games more, I actually end up sitting across from a technical writer who writes patents. I, I'm sitting next to someone at a bar because the meetup was on a, at a bar and the host of the, of the jazz meetup, because I'm into jazz, is a data scientist at a startup. You, and with our, with our, on a, on a professionally on our technology side of things, you know, two of our projects that were special projects, one was a Google Chrome extension that allows you to autocomplete literally anywhere on the internet, including LinkedIn, by the way, with the best words and, and emojis. And then the other one was a smart speaker scheduler. We had zero idea whether it was going to work or not, but there were moonshots. There were things that have never been done before. And guess what? At least a smart speaker schedule, I think it's going to, it's going to take over the, our revenue. It's probably going to be a bigger portion of our revenue in the next 12 months. And, that's the kind of mindset I want to recommend to you is I know CMO CMOs are always thinking about, you know, how do I protect my job? How do I, or, or a marketer is always about how do I deliver? How do I make sense? But if you're not thinking about in the future, a small percentage of it is, is not towards the future. You're going to get, eventually you're going to get left behind by someone who already thought of, of the future and is making that the present. Yeah, you're you're going to be the disrupted, right? That's that's kind yeah. of what we were talking about. Is, is you can yeah. you? It's really a choice. You said something about you know the middle ground on one um, story that you were sharing. Uh, I don't know if there's a middle ground in regards to this. If if you're not forward thinking, you're automatically behind. It you're going to see all kinds of businesses. I mean, every, I mean, small businesses, you know, make just enough money to, you know, uh, take care of their family and, and whatnot, or certain small businesses turn into medium businesses. And then those businesses turn into big businesses and then eventually list on the, on the exchanges. Right. And then you become a, a public company and now you have other responsibilities. It, I, I would say it depends on your mindset and where you want to go with your business and how, and how in depth you want to go on the marketing side. You know, if you're happy making $20,000 a month and you can pay your child's, you know, college tuition and you can take care of your family, you can, you know, have a, you know, a great retirement, you're not going to think about, even if you do think about the innovative things that are coming down the road, you may not want to invest more than 2% of your resources and time into it. But if you really want to build the next big thing, if you really want to become as a coffee shop, the next big chain, if you really want to have, you know, a dozen or so nail salons and you start with one or a laundromat, you start with one laundromat, you want to be the laundromat for every college uh, town in, in, the, in the United States, you have to increase your uh, risk appetite and you have to start spending more on the marketing side. It doesn't mean you start spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, just increase the ratio between what you know really well and what you have absolutely no idea about, but you're seeing the trends behind it. Smart speaker scheduling, social audio. We were, I was talking to someone who runs a laundromat in New York City on Clubhouse the other day, and I told him, talk about what are the tips and tricks about keeping your home clean. College students, how do you, you know, how do you get into, you know, how do you help them, you know, keep themselves clean and hygiene and things like that, like keep it very top of funnel and then, Maybe they'll come to you. Maybe you have a, you end up doing a delivery service, right? And you become the college, you know, student's uh, best friend in terms of um, the the laundry service and whatnot. Everyone can think differently. It depends on how far you want to go and how uh, how far you're willing to go, and that'll directly impact your marketing, but also your product and everything else. And I would dare to say that we have lots of that type of evidence. And I even, you know, shared about, you know, being forced into learning digital as a salesperson. <laughs> and I mean, yep. you know, we, we have choices to make, right. You know, even, yep. you know, having three kids and, you know, uh, you, you have choices to make, you know, you can, you can either quit, you know, you can whine and complain, or, you know, you can stand up and try to move forward, yep. maybe even crawl a little bit and just, just try to get forward. And, and I think that's, you've given a lot of um, helpful tips and advice on how to be able to do that. So thank you. To, to your point, um, uh, I think Shakespeare said it in a 12th night, uh, and I just brought the quote, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. And uh, I, I feel like 
just life is life is an example of that. Um, you know, in my case, I, I, you know, entrepreneurship was thrust upon me. I had to figure things out on my own. I had to live off a thousand dollars a month, 700 for rent, 25 for utilities, and everything else was food. And, or I walked, uh, for, you know, to save on the subways and, uh, you, you really have to, you really figure out your limits, both in marketing and in general, in life, you figure out your limits and then you keep pushing them. Okay. So uh, to try to, you know, get people to get into that right, right mindset, Yes. Uh, and to accelerate, you know, some of their paths. Um, you know, I, I have a certain amount of, you know, resources and budget that I'm spending in a certain, a certain area um, where I'm not going to get anything else. Um, so there's some scarcity associated with it. Uh, you know, where would you say, hey, stop doing this, start doing that? Sales funnels. Number one thing. I mean, if you want to, if you want an example of someone who lives and breathes sales funnels, I have his books here as well. Russell Brunson. If you don't know the name, boy, are you missing out? Download his free. I mean, he gives the books away for free. I mean, you can get an audible version, uh, audible, an audio version of it. You can traffic secrets, expert secrets. There's a third one. I think it's called dot com secrets as well. But the first two are the ones that had the most impact for me. And the reason I say that is because he likes to say it's a 24 seven sales person working for you um, around the clock and cross selling, upselling you know, downselling as well. I mean, there's a great video on how he did millions of dollars worth of sales at Grant Cardone's 10, 10X conference a couple of years ago. Watch that video a thousand times because that'll explain to you exactly how any business in the world, literally any business in the world can u- utilize a sales funnel to increase their cart value, to increase, um, you know, just a- a- awareness, you know, reduce the sales uh, efforts you need to make in order to sell to the customer. And the second thing would be having a combination of nurturing existing customers in a car, in a in an ecosystem like a Facebook group or whatnot, allowing them to earn commissions off of referral marketing, affiliate marketing, so that they can bring other people into the the foray. Um, in addition to that, do a paid strategy as well. Maybe a few hundred dollars a month just to get started, start figuring out who your avatars are, um, spend increasing it to a few thousand dollars and continue funneling the traffic into your sales funnel and a sales calls if you're doing that and putting them into your Facebook group as well. That's a very simple over, like high level strategy that we're taking and we're doing and we, we're obviously doing really well. Um, and, and there are some other things, but that's where I would say is focus on nurturing, capturing and selling 24-7. Arjun Rai, thank you for sharing your analysis. How do the B2B DM gang listeners and watchers get in touch with you? Absolutely. It's a great question. HelloWoofy.com, H-E-L-L-O-W-O-O-F-Y.com. My email is on the bottom of the, of the, of the website, Arjun at HelloWoofy.com. But if you're going to email me, tell me your story. Tell me what kind of a business owner you are. What are the features you want us to build? What is something I can help you with? And if you become a customer, obviously, you know, please join the Facebook group. Please join our Friday networking calls where we actually walk you through how to build sales funnels and do paid advertising and things like that. But we want, like, we're literally on our mission to build the biggest company, helping the smallest. And if you're, if you're game with that, join the, join the family. We, we look forward to having a conversation with every single underdog around the world. Arjun Rai, we wish you the very best. Thank you. Virtual hugs. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Go now to join the B2B DM gang in the B2B Marketer LinkedIn group, where you can connect with other B2B DM disruptors and get access to our B2B DM cheat sheets, checklist, and guides. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, please help by going to iTunes to rate, review, and subscribe. And share the show on all of your digital platforms. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. And always remember, you can automate your lead capture, but you must lure your lead.